So on behalf of National Academy of Sciences, Delhi Chapter and MHRD Institution Innovation Council, the India Lupadhyay College, University of Delhi, which is organizing this program under the aegis of DBT Star College program, I welcome all of you and especially to Professor Malcolm. Uh, he'll be delivering his talk on endofullerenes nanoscale test tubes for single molecules and atom. And this, I would like to thank uh, the Nasi Delhi Chapter, Professor Joy Gattak, our principal, Dr. S. E. Chan, as well as our, the TIC of the Department of Chemistry, Dr. Vinod Kumar, and the whole team of MHRD who has pulled up this whole thing. And without much delay, I would like to introduce Professor Malcolm, who was born in 1957 in England. He did his BA Chemistry in 1978 from Carroll College, Oxford, and evil with Ray Freeman, Oxford, 1981, and postdoctoral research with Shimon Vega in 1982, and R. R. Ernst and during 1982 to 85. He was a staff scientist at uh, Francis Bitter National Magnet Laboratory, MIT, during 1985 to 1990. And he was a Royal Society Research Fellow at the University of Cambridge, UK, during 1990 to 1991. He joined as a lecturer and later elevated as professor at the University of Stockholm, Sweden. And since 2001, he is professor in Physical Chemistry, School of Chemistry, Southampton, UK, or there. He received Latsis Research Prize of ETH Zurich in 1985 and Goran Gustafan Prize in Chemistry in Sweden in 1996, Amber Prize of the International Society of Magnetic Resonance in 2005. He is honorary fellow of the Indian Society of Magnetic Resonance 2006, adjunct professorship of the TIFR Mumbai, India 2006, fellow of the Royal Society in 2007, Lockean Prize in Magnetic Resonance 2008. Fellow of the International Society of Magnetic Resonance in 2008, Prague Lectureship, Australian National University 2010, and Fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, India 2012. He received Russell Virian Prize in Nuclear Magnetic Resonance 2015 and Paul Callaghan Lecture 2019, and recently in 2020, uh, Yusuf Hamid Visiting Professorship. I welcome Professor Malcolm on behalf of the Nasi Delhi Chapter and the Dhyalupadhyaya College to deliver his talk. You can share your screen, sir. Okay, let me see. Um, um, oh. I have to say I don't immediately see how to do that. Maybe you can uh, bottom right hand side. On the bottom the right hand side, there is an option of present now. Oh, oh here we go. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and you can share your entire screen in that case. Yeah, uh, I have two screens. I just want to make sure I share the right one. Yeah. Um, is this, am I sharing now? Uh, oh, okay. It hasn't. I think it's coming. Yes, yes, it's coming up. Yeah. Okay. Well, Dr. Um, Manoj, thank you very much. That's a, a great pleasure for me to give this lecture. As you saw, actually, as uh, Dr. Manoj explained, um, um, I was uh, very happy to get a fellowship from the Royal Society to spend some time in India this year. Um, uh, this was the Yusuf Hamid visiting professorship. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't turn out because of coronavirus, of course. So I think that giving this lecture will be serve as a, a small consolation for that. Uh, and I hope that most of you um, find it interesting. Uh, and I think there should be something for most uh, attendees to find it interesting here. Um, we have several projects in our group, but the one I want to talk about uh, today is, is a large collaborative project involving uh, collaborations with many different institutes in different countries, who I'll mention as we go along. And it's on these very fascinating chemical systems called endofullerenes. Um, so let me try to explain what they are and then I can start to discuss the work which we and our collaborators have been doing. Uh, so the story of fullerene starts in 1985 when um, in particular Croto, Curl and Smalley um, uh, demonstrated the existence of these molecules, symmetrical cages of 60 carbon atoms and some higher analogs as well. 
1985. Actually, their research was on astrochemistry, um, not a topic which you might think has a great deal of practical applications. But this maybe teaches us something that sometimes in research you don't always get what you're looking for and indeed um, uh, what you can find by surprise is often the most interesting part of your research. So they were examining the possibility of carbon, complex carbon molecules occurring in space and they did some lab experiments and they discovered that this molecule was formed C60. And of course in 1996 they got, uh, the team got a Nobel Prize for that and it was probably one of the easiest Nobel Prize decisions in the history of the Nobel Prize, I, I venture to imagine. Um, now it was uh, immediately realized once this molecule was identified that there was a cavity inside. Here's some wording from a later paper by Saunders. So the hollow interior is large enough to enclose atoms. And in particular this last sentence, atoms or small molecules can be contained and held without need for binding interactions. So these molecules with, uh, in which uh, an atom or a molecule is encapsulated inside uh, become test tubes for the study of these molecules or atoms. And that's a great deal of our research and those of the, our collaborators uh, is concerned with studying what that means and what it lets us do, which you couldn't do uh, in other ways. So the cavity has a diameter of 3.6 angstroms and that's just large enough to put small molecules inside. Of course, how you get them inside is not a trivial matter. Um, so the first endofullerenes which were described were metallofullerenes. And in fact, the same team um, who had discovered the existence of fullerene very quickly discovered that if the uh, high temperature procedure they used um, was conducted with metal in the presence of metals, you could trap metal atoms inside the fullerenes. And that's, a, that's now a large topic by itself with hundreds, maybe thousands of papers on that. But it's not something I'm going to be concerned with in this talk. Uh, another development in the field was sometime later by the group of Saunders and collaborators who realized that um, even the existing synthesis of C60 at that time generated small quantities of compounds with noble gases inside the cage which were then called helium at C60 and neon at C60. And this uh, nomenclature with the at C60 indicating an endohedral species has now become um, standard. Um, so these systems were formed at that time by vaporizing carbon in the presence of a noble gas. And then uh, as the carbon condenses again, a very small amount creates the fullerene and a small amount of the fullerenes condense trapping a noble gas atom inside but the yield is extremely poor so uh, it's uh, ppm levels of um, of noble gas endofullerene so and it is possible to do very laborious purification procedures afterwards but basically these molecules were only available in trace amounts which was enough to do some preliminary experiments now the major breakthrough in this field was done in Japan by the group of Koichi Komatsu who succeeded in encapsulating molecular hydrogen inside C60 and sometime later his student who was by then an independent researcher Yasumarata succeeded to do a similar procedure with water and these are really seminal papers in the field and um, it turned out that I was also involved in the um, uh, NMR of uh, uh, endofullerenes uh, at that time and I started a collaboration with uh, Koichi Komatsu which developed very, uh, very well and later they helped um, our co-workers in Southampton to develop their own synthetic procedures so I'm very grateful for them. Um, now these uh, uh, Komatsu and Murata, they succeeded this by a really ambitious and remarkable set of organic chemistry reactions 
Um, this is a slide from YAS, which uh, sketches just how it, how it was done. Um, C60 fullerene is now commercially available. Um, and it's possible through organic chemistry to attach external groups to the fullerene. And by doing that, you open an orifice. And then with a combination of high temperature and pressure in some cases, although in some cases in rather mild conditions, um, a molecule may be encapsulated inside the orifice. And then that's hard enough, but the, the really hard and innovative part of the reaction is actually the removal of the exohedral groups to seal up the cage again, to give a pristine cage still encapsulating the small molecule. So that's done in a sequence of many different chemical reactions. I think there's actually 10 steps in all, uh, but it may be conducted in moderately high overall yield and leads to macroscopic, chemically pure, homogeneous uh, quantities of, um, of these remarkable compounds. And that's been called molecular surgery on the basis that you sort of open a hole, implant something, and then sew up the hole again afterwards. Um, so the compounds which are available this way, or in closely related ways, are H2C60, which was Komatsu's uh, achievement. And since then, there have been the isotopomers generated of HD and D2 as well. The H2O C60 of Murata, and there are also isotopomers of those compounds available too. Uh, we've worked to, with the oxygen 17 labeled water, which uh, this is an NMR active nucleus, so, so uh, has some interesting NMR, NMR properties, this compound, although I think I won't show that today. Uh, and then I would say the next breakthrough in the field was done by our colleagues in Southampton. So, Richard Whitby um, is a very skilled chemist who got involved in this um, and decided to repeat the uh, Komatsu Murata reactions and also improve them somewhat. And his student, Andrea Krakmalnikov, succeeded in the synthesis of a new compound, HF in C60. Um, HF has an electric dipole, so we have a freely rotating electric dipole trapped inside a cage. And this was published a few years ago. Uh, this shows you what these substances look like in solution. They give purple uh, solutions in organic solvents. Um, recently, uh, Sally Bloodworth, also in the Richard Whitby group, uh, succeeded in a new procedure which allowed the synthesis of methane in C60. And actually this required some new chemistry, which I won't go into, but um, the orifice needs to be somewhat larger and the reactions to close it again uh, even more tricky than the, uh, the Komatsu and Murata procedures. And actually the same group recently has used the same uh, synthetic procedure um, to synthesize the noble gas endofullerenes, uh, helium. In fact, there's also argon and neon now available. Um, but the helium endofullerenes, uh, both the helium-4 and the rare helium-3 isotope are now available, but this time in macroscopic quantities. So these are not trace amounts, these can be tens or hundreds of milligrams. And that enables all sorts of different spectroscopic and um, neutron scattering techniques to be applied to them. And I'll show some results for those things. So we have available then to us um, relatively large quantities of these remarkable substances. Um, so just to summarize then, endofullerenes are symmetrical carbon cages containing single molecules or atoms. Um, they uh, usually come in black powder form. In solution, they're purple. And the uh, particular interest in them is that they're very pure, they can be made very pure by chemical methods. Uh, they're completely stable uh, over a very wide range of temperatures. So there have been experiments performed all the way from millikelvin up to several hundred C. Uh, large amounts are available and you can also do external chemistry on these materials. I won't talk about that, but you can make derivatives and 
tag them with various reagents and other uh, paramagnetic species and, and so on. Uh, so they're very versatile and become a, a very interesting subject for study. Uh, here's one uh, example, um, not topic of my talk, but just uh, I think a very pretty example from the laboratory of Andrei Chlobistov, who is one of our collaborators in Nottingham. He does um, very high resolution uh, transmission electron microscopy. Uh, this shows actually HF and C60 molecules uh, encapsulated in uh, single wall ca carbon nanotubes and then imaged by electron microscopy. And you can see the nanotube, you can see the, the uh, P's of, carbon, uh, of C60 lined up inside the pod. And inside the C60, you can make out the fluorine atom of HF in C60. So you can really visualize these systems on an atomic level as well. Now, just to set some background, if we start to talk now about uh, helium in C60, so it's C60 with a single helium atom in. And actually, if you, um, the graphic here um, employs the van der Waals radii of the, the relevant atoms. And you can see that the helium atom is pretty uh, snug in there. It's pretty tight, but there's a little space for it to move around. And in fact, it's that moving around inside the cage or actually the oscillation of the helium inside the cage, which gives rise to some interesting properties in different spectroscopic techniques, as I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so uh, I think many people will be surprised about this picture. It, the, the, these sorts of ball and stick pictures don't often give a very accurate picture of the actual space available. If you use a space filling model, you can see that the helium is actually pretty large compared to the cavity. And it, um, it fits about half of the space in the cavity, actually. There's room for a little bit more and it's possible to put larger molecules in there. Uh, now, I often get asked when giving this sort of talk, can the helium escape from the C60? And the, the answer is basically no. Um, and just to illustrate that point, there's a paper here um, from 2000 uh, on geological deposits which contain helium endofullerenes. Um, so there's a, this, this example here is from an impact crater of a meteorite, which apparently is almost 2 billion years old. And um, fullerenes have been found in the rocks produced in that crater and also even helium endofullerenes. And in this paper, these authors argue that the isotope ratio of the helium endofullerenes indicates that they actually have an origin outside the solar system. And, and probably predating, in fact, the formation of the solar system. So these molecules are completely stable, even under rather extreme conditions. So before getting to the molecular spectroscopy of these systems, I just want to show a few pieces of NMR data, which by itself is pretty interesting, I think. Um, just for those of you who are not too familiar with NMR, NMR is a spectroscopic technique which uses nuclear magnetism. So the magnetic um, moments of nuclei at the center of atoms. And in NMR, one places a sample in a strong magnetic field. One applies radio waves. One receives radio waves. And uh, through various complicated forms of analysis, one can get all sorts of information about the molecular structure, uh, dynamics, and anatomy in the form of magnetic resonance imaging, which of course is a very well-known technique. Uh, in our context of endofullerenes, um, we'll be interested in the magnetic nuclei which uh, concern us are carbon-13, which is found in, in the cages. Since the cages contain 60 carbon atoms and the abundance of carbon-13 is about 1%, then very roughly about half of the cages contain a single carbon-13. Um, if it's water endofullerene or hydrogen endofullerene, there's also proton nuclei of the hydrogen. And in the case of uh, water, there can also be the oxygen 17 nuclide of the oxygen. Um, 
For the helium endofullerenes, then we're talking about carbon-13 in the cage. And if it's the helium-3 endofullerene, the helium-3 nucleus is also an NMR nucleus and gives a good NMR signal. And we've done experiments on all, on all those things. Uh, just to talk about the carbon-13 NMR briefly, this is a small portion actually of the carbon-13 spectrum of uh, C60 or actually helium in C60 in solution. Uh, it's not completely pure. So the main peak here in this particular sample comes from empty C60 with a single carbon-13 in the cage. Uh, very close to it, on the high delta side, is the peak from the endofullerene with helium-4 in C60. Uh, and there's a small shift of about 24 parts per billion between those two peaks. The helium presence of the helium slightly influences the chemical shift of the carbon cage. And you can see from this spectrum that the sample, uh, this particular sample, has probably about 30% or 40% of the cage is filled with helium-4. Uh, and in fact, we have samples where, uh, which are essentially chemically pure helium-C60. But in this case, you see both peaks. Uh, this is a side point, but worth remarking on. Um, uh, there are two small peaks, uh, which you can just see in the baseline here. If you blow up the spectrum, you see two additional peaks. Uh, in fact, you see them just for C60 as well. You can see them here. Uh, those small peaks were spotted by my student George, George Bacanu, and they're actually due to um, uh, molecules which ha also have two carbon-13s adjacent to each other in the cage as well. Um, in fact, there are two peaks because C60 has two different sorts of carbon-carbon bonds, uh, and the bonding between the two carbons influences the position of these peaks. So they're in the ratio of two to one, and that's because of the abundance of the double and single bonds in C60. So that was the side issue actually, which came out of uh, our investigations, um, which we recently published. In fact, that's just out that paper. Um, if you look at the helium-3 C60, uh, the spectrum is very similar. Uh, one difference is the endohelial shift is slightly different. That's maybe interesting by itself, and we're working on understanding that. But the most uh, remarkable thing really is that there's a small splitting in the carbon-13 spectrum. It's very small. It was only seen because George was persistent enough to do a tremendous shimming job on the magnet to achieve very high homogeneity. And then one could see this very small splitting of about 70 millihertz uh, which is actually a very unusual J coupling between the helium-3 inside the cage and the carbon-13 in the encapsulating cage. There is, of course, no formal chemical bond between those two atoms. So this is very unusual. Um, as far as we know, it's the first uh, observation at all of a J coupling involving helium-3. And it's a very neat and remarkable example of a non-bonded J coupling, a phenomenon which is known in some other compounds, but maybe never in such extreme cases where there's really no chemical bond linking these two uh, atoms or molecules. And that's something we're preparing now for publication. It's a, an interesting matter of quantum chemistry to understand where this coupling comes from, in fact. Now let's turn our attention now to the quantum mechanics of an encapsulated atom like helium. To get into that topic, I'm first going to talk about something more familiar, which is the hydrogen atom. So a hydrogen atom consists of an electron, uh, which is bound to a proton through the Coulomb interaction between these opposite charges. So the electron, of course, has charge minus E. It doesn't have an electric dipole moment, although there are um, experiments underway to try to detect that, but so far with negative results and it has spin one half. And of course the nucleus has positive charge. Uh, the proton also has no electric dipole moment as far as anyone knows and has a uh, spin one half as well. So the, essentially the electron is confined to the vicinity of the proton through the uh, attractive force 
uh, due to their opposite charges. Um, but the electron, of course, can circulate around the proton, and that leads to the very well-known uh, energy level structure. When you solve the Schrodinger equation, you get a set of uh, quantum levels with different quantum numbers, um, in particular, a, a principal quantum number n, and an angular momentum quantum number l, which take the values shown here. And for historical reasons, the solution to the Schrodinger equation is known, are known as orbitals with these designations of 1s, 2s, and so on. But mathematically, they refer to these sets of quantum numbers. And the separation between these energy levels in uh, electron volts units is approximately 10 electron volts, which means that transitions between these levels are up in the uh, ultraviolet. So that's the hydrogen atom. Now, if we take helium in C60, there are differences, but the system is fundamentally rather similar. So there's obviously no charge for the helium, and no net charge, that is. Uh, there's no electric dipole, and in fact, there's no spin either. So in a way, this is a cleaner system than the hydrogen atom, or a, a simpler system. But the basic principles still apply that the helium can circulate around inside the cage. And if you solve the Schrodinger equation for this case, you get solutions which are very similar. Um, so again, a set of quantum numbers, n for a principal quantum number, l for an angular momentum quantum number. The details of the energy level structure are a bit different from hydrogen because the potential is different. It's not a Coulomb potential. Um, but a constraining potential due to intermolecular interactions. And also because the helium is much heavier than an electron, the energy levels are much more closely spaced. So the typical energy spacing is about 10 milli electron volts, so about a thousand times less than in uh, the hydrogen atom. And that places these transitions, not in the ultraviolet region, but in the far infrared, or actually in the terahertz region. So one can perform two types of spectroscopy, actually are useful for studying this, terahertz or far infrared spectroscopy and inelastic neutron scattering. And with our collaborators, we've conducted both of those experiments. Those of you who have a microphone on, can you mute it, please? So these are some results from uh, the terahertz spectroscopy which are done in the laboratory of Thomas Rohm in, in Tallinn, one of our collaborators. And these are very recent results. They've not been published. In fact, not really been completely interpreted yet. But you see a, a ladder of terahertz peaks um, and their provisional assignment at this point to the transitions between these quantum energy levels. Um, the spectra here are at different temperatures. So as you raise the temperature, you can start to populate some of the higher energy levels and get some of these higher energy transitions. So those are currently under interpretation right now. Uh, what those levels tell you, apart from being interesting science, I think, is they tell you a great deal about the potential with which the helium interacts with the surrounding cage. And that provides details of intermolecular or interatomic interactions, which are very difficult to obtain some other way. That's a topic of current research. Uh, you also see the same peak, or at least one of the peaks, in neutron scattering. Um, so this work has been done in collaboration with the Institute uh, Lauer Langevin in Grenoble, ILL uh, Grenoble, uh, led by um, the team of Stefan Rolls, um, in which one scatters neutrons off this substance at low temperature, and one also sees a scattering peak which is attributed to the uh, excitation of the helium inside the cage. Okay, if we now progress to a slightly more complicated system of um, hydrogen, dihydrogen molecules trapped in C60. So as described, these were the, these systems were obtained as the first molecular endofullerenes, uh, which are not metallic endofullerenes. 
the first produced by Komatsu. Uh, and again, you see that the hydrogen molecule fits pretty snugly inside the cage, but there's complete room for it to rotate freely. So the hydrogen molecules in the cage, they rotate essentially completely freely at all temperatures from cryogenic temperatures, a few degrees Kelvin, all the way up to room temperature. And they can also oscillate back and forth within the cage, uh, similar to the way helium uh, does, as I just described. And the hydrogen molecules themselves can vibrate. So this is a more complicated system with more degrees of freedom. So let's think about the quantum mechanics of that. First of all, let's consider the rotation of the hydrogen molecules. So if you imagine hydrogen molecules in high vacuum in a gas, um, then we have rotation of the hydrogen molecules and that rotation is quantized. And that's very well known, it's uh, basic quantum mechanics, the quantum mechanics of a free rotor. And many of you will be familiar with this, I think that you ha again have a set of quantum numbers usually called J. Quantum numbers J is uh, zero, one, two, three, a set of energy levels and a set of uh, eigenfunctions of the Schrodinger equation. So these are the wave functions of the rotating molecule um, as the molecule rotates in space. Now hydrogen has another feature which makes it very interesting. Um, the two nuclei are two protons, they're fermions to identical fermions, so the Pauli principle applies. And this leads to the development of nuclear spin isomers, where um, the rotational states divide up into two, um, two sets. The, the set of rotational states uh, of the e with even values of J, this has nuclear spin zero, meaning the two nuclear spins cancel each other out. And that's called parahydrogen and the set of rotational levels with J is, uh, with odd values of J, which is called orthohydrogen, and that has nuclear spin one, so parallel nuclear spins. And in fact, these two forms of hydrogen gas can be separated and they have slightly different physical and chemical properties. So one also uh, then in the uh, hydrogen endofullerenes, one also uh, can study the ortho and para hydrogen. Now there's something else as well. So the hydrogen molecule rotates, so that's angular momentum J, but the hydrogen molecule may also circulate around in the cage, which is the orbital angular momentum L. And in the theory of angular momentum, when you have two uh, sources of angular momentum, J and L, they can couple together to make an, a total angular momentum which is called the lambda, which takes values running from the distance, the difference between J and L and the sum of J and L in steps of one. So one develops an energy level structure which is defined by the principal quantum number N, the angular momentum quantum number L and the total angular momentum quantum number lambda. So a more complex energy level structure. And in fact, it's more complicated than that because you also have the vibration of the hydrogen as well, which has a vibrational quantum number too, as well, and nuclear spin. So you have um, a set actually in total of five quantum numbers here, plus actually the M, and ML and MI quantum numbers, which are not shown here. Um, and you can study the transitions between these uh, states of hydrogen using a variety of spectroscopies. So one can use mid-infrared spectroscopy to study the vibrational transitions, which also display structure because of these quantized rotations. Uh, one can study the rotational transitions without vibrational excitation by far infrared or terahertz spectroscopy. Um, the transitions between the spin isomers, between ortho and para, are not allowed in electromagnetic spectroscopy. One can't see them, but they are visible in neutron scattering. 
So one can study the, the relative energies of the ortho and para hydrogen using neutron scattering. And then in the presence of a strong magnetic field, one can um, split the energies by the Zeeman splitting and do magnetic resonance experiments on those. And together with our collaborators, then we've performed all of these forms of spectroscopy. So this is an example, a rather complex picture of the mid-infrared um, spectrum of hydrogen in C60. This data were produced again by the, our collaborators, uh, Thomas Rome and group in Tallinn. Um, and you see the energy level structure now shown in, in detail with assignments of the different spectroscopic transitions to these uh, different um, transitions involving the N, L and lambda quantum numbers. And in fact, the lower plots here show uh, simulations, or rather the upper plots actually, show theoretical simulations of the transitions here. And we can see we have a good explanation of, of most of the features here. Um, with some exceptions, there's some splittings here, which is still a matter of some contention. Um, so there's a great deal of detail now known about the energy levels of these uh, small molecule like hydrogen inside the fullerene cavity. If we now turn to water in C60, so again, um, the, um, the water is tight in there. Um, doesn't have much room to oscillate. And in, in, in fact, the, uh, the quantized levels associated with the translation of the water, that means the water bouncing around inside the cavity, actually become a high energy for this molecule and are not populated at low temperature. Uh, but you still have the rotation of the water, which is uh, essentially completely free, even at the lowest temperatures and you have the vibration of the water. And that again gives rise to a rich uh, variety of spectroscopy. Now, what's particularly, maybe particularly interesting for water is that, and less well known for, than for hydrogen, water also has spin isomers. So just like for hydrogen, you have two fermion nuclei, the two protons, the Pauli principle still applies. So you have para water with total nuclear spin zero and ortho water with total nuclear spin one. And if you're interested in NMR, as our group mainly is, then uh, the NMR signal from water, and this applies to ordinary water in a test tube, just as it does for water in fullerenes, but the NMR signals come entirely from the ortho water which has nuclear spin one, and the para water, which in ordinary water is present as a quarter of the sample, does not give an NMR signal. It has nuclear spin zero. But for water, you also have rotational levels. It's a bit more complicated than for hydrogen because you now have a triatomic molecule with lower similar symmetry than for hydrogen. But the basic physics is pretty much the same. So you have a ground state which is para water. Um, you have an excited state of para water, and you also have the state of ortho water. The, the lowest state of ortho water is above para water by about 35 Kelvin. So that means in liquid helium you can take the water down to para water. And I'll show some results uh, demonstrating that. Yeah, so in, just in detail then, the energy level structure of water, these are the, the rotational levels of uh, water in C, uh, C60, or actually a freely rotating water molecule. They're labeled with three quantum numbers, which uh, the, the, the left-hand number, the bold one is J, just like for hydrogen, and there are two additional quantum numbers called Ka and Kc, which I won't talk about here. But there's a um, long-standing molecular spectroscopy of water classifies the energy levels by these uh, quantum numbers and the, the positioning of the energy levels is well known from spectroscopic studies. So if you think about freely rotating water molecules which are in thermal equilibrium, 
with an environment, then you can plot the fraction of para water and ortho water against temperature according, according to the Boltzmann distribution. And basically above about 50 Kelvin, you have actually three ortho water molecules to every one para molecule. But because of the energy splitting, below 50 Kelvin, 30 Kelvin, down to four Kelvin, you get increasing amounts of para water. So at four Kelvin in thermal equilibrium, you essentially have pure para water. And it's possible to study the uh, spin isomers of water using, for example, neutron scattering. So again, these are data from the ILL in Grenoble. Um, just a selected piece of data. Uh, without talking in detail about this, the most interesting side of the spectrum here is actually on the left-hand side here. That's called neutron energy gain. What that means is that as neutrons pass the sample, they pick up energy from molecular transitions. So in this case, you have ortho water molecules, which are in the uh, ortho water ground state. And then they give this amount of energy to the neutrons as the neutrons fly by. So as the water converts from ortho to para, the neutron energy is increased and that shows up in this neutron scattering spectrum. Now, what's uh, re remarkable here is that this um, lower spectrum here is obtained at a sample temperature of 1.5 Kelvin. And at that temperature, there should not be any ortho water in the sample. Because as we've just seen in thermal equilibrium, everything should be para water. But what in fact happens is that as the sample is cooled, the ortho water goes down to its ground state, the para water goes down to its ground state, and the ortho para conversion is very slow. So the ortho water molecules are actually trapped in their lowest state for many hours. And they're essentially waiting there until the neutrons come along, and then they can give a neutron and go down to para. So you see this remarkable peak here as a gain in the neutron energy observed at this very low temperature of 1.5 Kelvin. So that proves that you have a population of trapped ortho water molecules in the H2O C60 sample at low temperature. And you also see this actually in the NMR spectrum. Uh, this shows some NMR data obtained by Salvo Mamone in our group some years ago. Um, uh, and what this spectrum is shows simply the intensity of the proton NMR signal as a function of time, as one changes the temperature of the sample. So it goes as follows. One starts with a sample at 50 Kelvin, which in this context is rather warm. And then one cools the sample to five Kelvin, relatively rapidly. And the NMR signal increases now that increase is actually nothing remarkable. It's uh, those of you who know about nuclear magnetism know that the nuclear magnetism is inversely proportional to the temperature. That's called the Curie law. So as you cool the sample by a factor of 10, the NMR signal increases by a factor of 10. So that's expected. What's not expected or not conventional, let's say, is that as you leave the sample for hours in the magnet, the NMR signal gradually declines in intensity. And that's because the ortho water, which has nuclear spin, is slowly converting to para water, which does not have nuclear spin. So the NMR signal gradually reduces in intensity. And then after 10 hours, the sample temperature was increased to 32 Kelvin. NMR signal goes down, that's the Curie law. Uh, and then as one continues to wait, the NMR signal bounces back again and that's because the para water is now reconverting to ortho water. So we can follow these conversion processes in the NMR response as well. A question arose as to whether we could study the convention, conversion of para water to ortho water, not at cryogenic temperature, but at room temperature. It was not known, actually, no data has ever been acquired 
on the spin isomer conversion of water under ambient conditions. So we set out to try to do it. And the way we did it, and in fact, this experiment was devised by Benno Meyer, who was then in my group, is as follows, that one has a cryostat in which the sample is cooled with liquid helium. And we allow the sample to rest for a long time in the liquid helium. So we convert to para water. And then with compressed helium gas, the sample is fired like a bullet through a tube, impacts a receiver, and then the uh, solution, or in fact a frozen solution of the H2OC60 is sprayed into the NMR tube where you can start to do an NMR experiment. And actually the short video here just shows the uh, tube. Uh, you will see in a minute Right, so that was the sample being fired into the tube. You see the, you see the purple solution spreading in the tube. So essentially the sample, which is at four Kelvin, is being very rapidly dissolved in a solvent at room temperature. And then you can follow the NMR signal and um, we get uh, the NMR signal intensity slowly increasing, actually with a time constant of about 30 seconds. So this reflects the conversion of para water to author water in the endofullerene at room temperature. And that was actually unexpectedly slow. Uh, most of us had expected much faster conversion than that. Another experiment which was done recently on this sample is with a new set of collaborators um, headed by the group of uh, Mohsen Sajadi, who's in Berlin. And uh, this group does very sophisticated, ultra-fast pulsed terahertz experiments in which a very short pulse of terahertz radiation, only half a picosecond long, is uh, passed through the sample and then its response. And they recently got some very beautiful results, um, which are shown here. So uh, these oscillations, uh, for an NMR spectroscopist, these look very much like a free induction decay, the sort of typical NMR signal. And in fact, the terahertz spectroscopists call this a free induction decay as well. So this is basically the sort of free induction decay you would have in an NMR spectrometer in pulsed Fourier transform NMR. The big difference, though, is the time scale. So whereas in NMR, one may have, say, uh, tens of microseconds here or milliseconds, uh, in this experiment, the time scale is picoseconds. So many orders of magnitude faster, but otherwise the principle is much the same. And you can do a Fourier transform of this free induction decay. These are data at a range of temperatures to obtain the terahertz response peaks uh, as a function of temperature here in this representation. And you see the low temperature, we get the three peaks, which are due to the uh, rotation, the quantized rotation of the water at low temperature. In fact, at somewhat high temperature, a new peak comes up whose nature is actually currently under investigation. It's not well understood at the moment. Um, but this is an example of doing very sophisticated pulse terahertz spectroscopy on these remarkable substances. What's interesting here is that these oscillations go on for a pretty long time. So tens of picoseconds, which is very unusual for uh, uh, a molecular rotational mode at low temperature. And the final sample I just want to turn to is a very new sample produced by the Whitby group, which is methane in C60. So there was some very novel chemistry was needed to synthesize this molecule. Um, the methane is just about the largest molecule you can fit into the cavity. Um, and indeed some uh, chemical innovations had to be made to get this to work. But eventually it was successful and a small amount of methane C60 was produced. Uh, this is also an interesting substance which displays spin isomerism and complex rotational structure, but we haven't yet really started to explore that. What has been done is some reasonably basic but nevertheless uh, interesting NMR experiments. For those of you who are NMR spectroscopists, you will know about the inept pulse sequence, 
in which polarization is transferred from the protons of the methane to the central carbon and you get characteristic spectral signatures which are generated in this type of experiment. Uh, you can do the proton NMR, the strongly negative chemical shift of the protons is due to the shielding influence of the cage. Um, and all of this uh, simply goes to prove that we do have indeed have methane in the cage. Maybe the most uh, interesting aspect of this uh, work is the fact that the synthesis is now possible through um, a new chemical procedure. This gives a lot of promise to encapsulating some other molecules which should be even more interesting such as ammonia, uh, oxygen, the two of the things that are currently under investigation or, or more accurately we were under investigation before the virus stopped the work but the, they will soon um, uh, resume. Um, and we're very interested actually in these possible new, new systems. Um, ammonia has a very interesting maser re resonance. In fact, uh, ammonia in the gas phase was the first molecule used for construction of a maser back in the 1950s. And paramagnetic molecules such as O2 have unpaired electrons. So we're very interested in exploring uh, that, that adds yet another dimension to the spectroscopy of these endohedral molecules. So we're very look, looking forward to very much to uh, exploring those systems when they do become available. So what is all the, this work for? How, how is it motivated? Um, a lot of people when I give this sort of talk ask, say that this is very interesting, but how on earth do you get funding for that? And um, sometimes I wonder myself. Of course, it's very interesting basic science and a wonderful playground of pretty basic molecular quantum mechanics. Uh, but there are some possible uh, applications beyond that. I should say that the, the chemistry involved in making these molecules is a remarkable achievement by itself and develops the science of how to do that and how to manipulate molecules in a controlled way is, is advanced by these efforts because that can have spin-off applications elsewhere. Um, quantum chemistry is also an area which is, can be much advanced by these molecules. Just to give one example, as I briefly alluded to, the potential by which these molecules are constrained in the cavity is generated by non-bonded interactions. And those non-bonded interactions are, are very interesting for quantum chemists. They're difficult to calculate by current algorithms. The standard algorithm in this field, density functional theory, does typically not do a particularly good job at those interactions. It's an approximation, of course, and those approximations uh, tend to uh, cause um, some decrease in performance for those intermolecular interactions, which are very important for understanding how molecules interact with each other without chemical bonds. Um, so we expect actually that these systems where there's very solid spectroscopic data on this constraining potential, these could be excellent uh, benchmark systems for those algorithms. Uh, we're also looking with some collaborators into the possibility of constructing uh, lasers and masers using these molecular systems. And uh, one can contemplate applications also to quantum information processing in which uh, the energy levels of encapsulated molecules and atoms are used as bits in quantum computation or even for storing information for a long time. So with that, I'd like to conclude my talk, uh, but give uh, many thanks to the people involved in this work. So we couldn't do anything, of course, without the synthetic achievements. So the Sandal achievements by the uh, Kyoto groups, who also were very helpful in getting our group in Southampton or the group of Richard Whitby started with the synthesis. Um, and in particular, the great achievements of Andrei Krakmalnikov, who synthesized the HF system, uh, Sally Bloodworth and Gabby Hoffman, who have been doing the recent work on the methane and the helium endofullerenes, and continue to work on the, the, uh, the newer uh, molecular systems as well. Uh, in NMR, in my group, then, uh, the people uh, who've done, been most deeply involved are George Bakanu, 
who is a sort of multi-talented person who's doing all sorts of different forms of spectroscopy. Uh, and Benno and Carol, who have now left the group, but did a lot of the seminal work on the H2O system. Uh, and then we have a large number of collaborators on the infrared and terahertz. Um, principal is, amongst them are the group of Thomas Röhm in Tallinn and his co-workers, uh, to whom we're extremely grateful for their um, wonderful experimental work and, and theoretical interpretations. And recently we've been collaborating with these uh, groups in Berlin, Moscow and Stuttgart, led by Mosen Sajadi, Boris Gorshinov and Martin Dressel. And this work has also been heavily involved by George in Southampton. Actually, George uh, was determined to try the terahertz spectroscopy of helium in C60. I and everyone else told him that it couldn't possibly work. Helium doesn't have a dipole moment, doesn't have a charge. For sure, you will see nothing. But he was persistent enough to, um, determined enough to do the experiment anyway, and of course got some fine results. Um, and then we have a wonderful collaboration with neutron scattering team in Grenoble, uh, led by Stefan Rolls. Um, earlier in uh, Nottingham uh, by Tony Holswell and Salvo Mamona. Uh, George is also involved in the neutron scattering. And uh, we also have collaborations with uh, microscopy groups in Nottingham, Phil Moriarty doing tunneling microscopy and Andrei Klopistov doing uh, scanning electron microscopy, excuse me, transmission electron microscopy. So with that, I, I thank all of them and I thank you for your attention. I'm very happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Professor Malcolm. Well, uh, there are certain questions in the chat section. Okay, uh, let me um, read the yeah, presentation. Yeah. Right, so let me see. Um, I can go into the chat. Yes, uh, you have to okay. scroll down. Do you want to select questions for me or shall I scroll? Uh, there, through are, there are five and, uh, to six questions only. Yeah. Okay, let me see. Yeah, I think yes, okay. uh, Dr. Divya. From here. Okay, so Dr. Divya says, would like to know the reasons for decrease in amplitude of helium C60 than C60. Ah, uh, maybe uh, you're probably talking about the NMR spectrum. Um, I think um, that's for the simple reason that there are, in the particular sample shown, um, the uh, about 40 percent of the cages have helium inside and 60 percent don't have helium inside so therefore the helium c60 peak is weaker than the um empty c60 peak is that does that is that uh, clear enough uh, does that answer your question dr divya Maybe his microphone well, could be turned Divya, on. If you are satisfied kindly, yeah, she can just write out in the chat section. You can take up the next question in that case. Um, okay. Um, how is the reactivity of molecules affected after entrapment inside the fullerene? If decreases, then how it will be beneficial? Um, so it's true. Um, not sure I can completely answer this. This is probably a better uh, topic for Richard Whitby, but um, if he's uh, in the chat, I'm not sure, but um, uh, it is, um, uh, it has been detected that some endohedral molecules do influence the reactivity of the fullerene. So that has been observed, I believe, for the HF in C60. So the, the HF uh, has an electric dipole moment and that influences the reactivity of the fullerene cage. Um, now, I have to admit, though, beyond that, I don't know too much about that topic. Maybe if Maduleka, if you would uh, maybe like to uh, say something or uh, ask a question again, or uh, if you want to ask something more specific. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. That's fine. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, the next question is from Yukta Tomar, who says, how much the IR and other radiations affect the rotor tubes? What will happen if these IRs are increased? Um, I'm not completely sure actually what your question refers to there. Is it whether the fullerene itself is influenced by the radiation? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that is what you mean. Uh, if it is, then the fullerene itself is essentially completely transparent to the infrared radiation. So it passes straight through and only interacts with the endohedral molecule. Um, um, and in fact, the pulse terahertz spectroscopy uses extremely powerful infrared radiation, in fact. But to my knowledge, this is not, does not perceptively um, change the composition of the sample or something like that. I'm not sure if that is an answer to your question or not. Uh, unfortunately, I have, there's a request for me to increase my No, that, sound. that I've already answered, yeah. You already did, okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then um, the same person asked a question, at room temperature, did the conversion was effective compared to cryogenic temperature? So the spin isomer conversion is much faster at room temperature. So it's about 30 seconds at room temperature while at cryogenic temperature, it's many hours. So that's the uh, main answer to that question, I think. And then there's a question from yourself, Manoj. Um, uh, right, so this is about the uh, metallo endofullerene, gadolinium in C82. Can it act as an intracellular superoxide scavenger? I see. Um, could be six, subsequently used as a cytoprotective MRI contrast agent. I see. So you're um, so as I'm sure you you know, given the question, then uh, gadolinium complexes are often used as um, MRI contrast agents due to the strong paramagnetivity of the gadolinium, and I believe that gadolinium endofullerene has also been explored for that purpose. Um, uh, and here you're uh, asking an interesting question as to whether the gadolinium C82 could possibly have a dual purpose, not only acting as a MRI contrast agent, but also um, actually mopping up um, reactive oxygen species and hence protecting the cells. Well, it's a very interesting question, but unfortunately I don't know the answer to it. Um, possibly. Thank you. I don't Thank know. You. A very nice question though. Um, Ah, uh, a question from Professor Diwan um, about the pair of carbon-13 nuclei in helium C60. Could we see carbon-carbon J coupling? Very good question. Uh, the answer is no, because the two, if you only have two carbon-13s, then um, they are magnetically equivalent and you don't see the carbon-carbon J coupling. However, we have also done work, which is described in our paper, uh, where you have more than two carbon-13s, and then you do have the influence of the carbon-carbon J coupling. So I would encourage you maybe to look up uh, our recent paper on that topic. I hope that answers your question. Um, and then, thank you very much for your compliments there. Uh, and then we have Sri Krishna Salunke. Uh, is it possible to prepare C60 with more than two molecules and change their stability and reactivity? Um, so the, the Japanese team, um, Murata, uh, they have prepared not C60, but actually C70, slightly larger, with a slightly larger cavity. It has been um, prepared with two hydrogen molecules inside. Um, and in fact, those two hydrogen molecules exchange places with each other. 
on a rather slow time scale. So there's some interesting spectroscopy there. Um, I think there may also be some work with two heliums. And uh, in fact, our, uh, our team or Richard Whitby's team have obtained recently some evidence of a tiny, tiny amount of C60 with two heliums. Uh, but that's at the moment very provisional. But it would indeed be very interesting to do that because in a way you get some strange type of artificial molecule in which two atoms are constrained to be uh, share the same space uh, in much the same way as a molecule but without actually being having a mutual chemical bond um, and that will indeed be provide a very interesting spectroscopic system which should also have spin isomers actually just the same as hydrogen so that's an interesting question and it's difficult the answer is it's difficult it's been done already in some cases um, uh, and that's a, but it's a current uh, research topic and hopefully the study of such systems will expand in the future uh, thank you again um, um, okay uh, under which circumstances is the trap molecule released out of the cage? Uh, well, at high enough temperature, um, and I think that temperature is around, here I'm not too sure, I think it's around 300, 400 C, uh, the cages start to rupture and then the molecules can escape. Um, and that has been observed. Um, uh, by vaporizing these systems. But um, it's possible to sublime the C60, the endo C60, um, uh, without damage at, uh, at uh, maybe 200 degrees. So under extreme conditions, the molecules do rupture. Um, thank you again for all those nice comments. Um, uh, we have a, a question by Gabika Sitinova. The CH4 influences also the reactivity of the open cage fullerene. Oh, oh, this is Gabby actually. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, she, I guess she's commenting on what was said before. So also the methane, apparently, I didn't know this. Apparently the, uh, this is uh, Gabriella Hoffman actually is her current name. Um, so she's uh, involved in synthesizing the methane and helium systems. And she uh, reminds me that uh, the methane also in influences the reactivity uh, of the open cage fullerene. This is before it's sealed up. Um, uh, more nice comments, thank you. What is the capable of C60 compounds in grams or milligrams? Um, I think for the what is now regarded as more or less a routine task or at least as an assembly line running in Richard Whitby's group um, of synthesizing for example the water C60 that uh, is now being churned out on 100 milligram scale and probably scattered around the world now there's maybe something close to a gram of that material um, the more difficult ones like the methane C60 are only available at the moment in, in milligram quantities. But that's the range we're talking about. And the, the techniques of producing these systems is a, 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 was advancing rapidly, let's say, until the coronavirus put a stop to it. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Diwan. Uh, what are the applications of trapping small molecules inside fullerene? Um, well, I uh, currently, there are no applications, it's probably fair to say, but there are quite a few directions for basic science to go in uh, with possible applications which are being investigated for, for example, for constructing solid state terahertz uh, mazes uh, as a source of terahertz radiation. That's one possible example, one possible application. And another application which I mentioned, which does look uh, promising in the near term, is to use these molecules as a benchmark for quantum chemistry calculations. Um, there's only then, one question, I think, which is uh, left out. 
uh, in the bottom, in the bottom. Okay, I see one here from Ruthin Francis. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, can we increase the size of the fullerene to trap larger molecules? Yes, uh, in particular the Japanese groups have done similar procedures on C70. Um, uh, I'm not, I don't recall any work of this kind on the fullerenes larger than that, although there may be such work. Um, so it's certainly possible to do that. I would say that such possibilities at the moment are limited by the capacity of the groups who are doing the chemistry. Uh, basically, you can't do everything, and it's it's difficult chemistry, and uh, it's a lot of synthetic uh, a lot of synthetic effort involved. But yes, if there's a strong enough motivation, I'm sure it can be done. Um, and I believe yeah. that yeah, I think you have taken up all the questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So uh, I would like uh, our college governing body chairman, Professor D. S. Rawat, to kindly say a few words about this whole program. Uh, thank you. Manoj, can you hear me? Yes, Sir, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Manoj, for organizing the beautiful program today. And I must thank uh, Mr. Malcolm for his wonderful presentation. Uh, though I uh, don't work in this area, but I could follow what you have been talking. And that uh, shows how good a uh, teacher you are. And uh, to me, actually, it was very surprising to see that you could, uh, you know, see two carbon-13 nuclei to each other, uh, next to each other, and could record the uh, carbon-13 signal for such molecule. And I hope that uh, our students, it's seven, quarter to eight now, close to quarter to eight here, and still there are many students attending your lecture. I'm sure that uh, most of our students must have been motivated with uh, the way you presented your talk. And I personally thank you for sparing your time and addressing to all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Any concluding remarks from your side, Professor Malcolm, how your experience has been? This is, I think, your first interaction with, uh, uh, with us. Uh, yes, I believe so, but I have been in India several times. Um, and I always thoroughly enjoy it there, and I hope to be able to come and visit you in person in the, sure, in the near sure. future. We, we it's would been love a great to pleasure. Thank you there. very much. We would love to have you there. So okay, on behalf of the uh, college, uh, on behalf of MHRD team, my colleagues, students, I would like to thank you. I would like to thank all the attendees. I would like to thank uh, Professor Rawat for sparing his valuable time for attending the whole lecture. And so uh, I'm closing this session and I request all the attendees to kindly fill up the feedback form. It will help us in organizing future lectures.